Hi guys, my name is Mansi Anand and a very warm welcome to RBI 247. So uh, guys, this video is being uh, recorded at home. So that is why we are uh, back to that format that we used to uh, uh, that we used to follow in the lockdown, right? So uh, as most of you would be knowing that in this session, in this series called RBI 247, we try to discuss few concepts which are of relevance to the pre people preparing for competitive exams. So if you are one of those, then do not uh, forget to watch the whole, whole session and I hope you fi find it beneficial, right? So let's not waste any time and move straight away to the questions. But before doing that, I would like to ask you guys to subscribe to our channel just a second okay um, you can subscribe to our channel and don't forget to press this bell icon which is flashing on the screen it can help you to stay in touch with us and get notified whenever a new video comes up you can also join our telegram group where you can post all your doubts and queries and we'll try to take them up in these sessions or we'll try to clear them uh, in the group itself right so moving ahead to question number one here is your question number one this question talks about bank holding companies so uh, following statements are here about bank holding companies and you have to select the ones which are incorrect so guys you can pause the video here read these three statements carefully and then decide that which one is the which one or which ones are the incorrect right so let's move ahead to the solution and the correct option for this question is option A. Option A means only one is the incorrect statement and rest two are correct statements. So guys I hope you must be hearing <coughs> this term called bank holding company in newspapers recently. It is being cited as one of the measures it is being cited as one of the measures to regulate Indian banking sector or uh, cited as a tool which can be helpful to the problems to the woes of Indian banking sector, right? So let us first understand that what is the meaning of bank holding company. So the name in itself tells you bank holding, a, basically a company which holds banks or banks are subsidiary to this particular company. Just a second guys okay right so uh, this is the basic meaning that if a here is a bank there should be a company holding it right and bank is a subsidiary to this particular bhc right so bank holding is a company that owns a significant stake or controlling interest in one or more banks. Basically, they have power over these banks and they do not run day to day operations of the bank. They own, they're not concerned with some basic functions of the bank or um, uh, the, uh, the, the deeds or the tasks of the lower management. But yes, they are concerned with the banks as they are the as they they are concerned with the actions of top management right so the incorrect statement is that these bhcs they provide banking services whereas the correct one should be that these companies do not provide banking services right so these companies they do not provide banking services themselves but they uh, they supervise the banks under them right here you can see that these banking bank holding companies they exercise control over management and company policies so guys here you can see strict regulation right this is one of the major aim behind this idea this uh, many uh, many experts such as kv kamath you must have heard about kv kamath i hope you remember the recommendations of kamath committee that we talked about in a session when they came up uh, by RBI, right? So K. V. Kamath also talked about creation of a bank, creation of banking holding companies, and whether they can be profitable. Because as you can see, that in Indian banking sector, which is which is riddled with the problem of NPAs, right? And what is the main reason behind NPAs? Obviously, reckless lending or lending to borrowers who are unable to pay back, right? So if 
there is a management or there is one um, they there is an entity which is above the bank or which is monitoring the actions of the banks there might be lesser chances of bad lending right so uh, is he suggests kv kamar recently talked about the creation of bank holding companies so these companies they can hire and fire managers set and evaluate strategies as i told you that they are concerned with the actions of top management not the lower management and they monitor the performance of subsidiaries business right so basically just keeping a check on the subsidiary banks bank of america city group jp morgan all are operated by holding company so these are some international banks big banks huge uh, uh, banking houses which are hold which are held by bank holding companies they are being cited as one of the major to solve the problems of indian banking sector right okay here you can see the pros and cons so the pro says well developed corporate governance because of regulation then flexibility in strategic transactions activities and investments obviously if the bank holding company is a powerful uh, entity and financially secure entity it might result in betterment for the subsidiary bank existing dividend reinvestment plan and grandfather trust preferred issuances can serve as useful capital management tool so basically uh, better capital management because see there is one entity whose main job is to uh, is just to look after the banks right and also it can relieve the burden of the regulators such as rbi because they are going to manage they are going to look after the activities of banks what are the cons obviously the cost associated with making sure that the banks are complying with rules and regulations and obviously there is additional regulatory oversight for non member banks right and after that capital structuring advantages may diminish over time so basically there can be uh, they they can be beneficial for some time but once they, but once uh, the the job is done the benefits might be saturated so these are some pros and cons of bank holding companies here is your question number 2 guys this question says improved technology which is attributed to investments in equipment leads to dash whereas improved technology which results in output increases without so here it is investment in new equipment and the second part says without investing in new equipment leads to dash right so this the, the answers are the terms which are usually uh, which which are commonly read in newspapers they are commonly they can co be seen commonly in newspapers right moving ahead to the solution and the solution says that the correct answer is option d option d means embodied technical progress and disembodied technical progress i hope you have read about you have read these terms in newspapers recently right so see they are very simple terms whenever we do whenever there is investment into new equipment and it leads to better production let's say there is a company which which wants to upgrade its processes and it buys some new machinery or let's say it imports some new machinery from the foreign countries in that case it is investing into some new equipment that is leading to increase in their production capacity then it can be called as embodied technical progress whereas if there is no new investment in equipment but let's say this company tries to reduces the waste produces the waste which is produced or tries to uh, tries to produce more uh, by availing the benefits of economies of scale or uh, tries to cut all the activities that lead to delay in production so basically they are trying to develop their production process they are trying to upgrade them but without investing into new technology and if output increase results from it by reduction of wastage by cost cutting that is known as disembodied technical progress so why are these terms important these terms are important because 
if because from the point of view of a country whenever we are thinking about how to develop a country or how to develop a particular industry the, the these factors are very important because we have to know that what proportion of output increase is contributed by labor what proportion of output increase is contributed by inc by upgradation in technology or by capital basically we should have an idea of contribution of different factors of production such as labor capital or the type of technology used right so if you know that which factor is going to contribute more then it is going to be easier to take decisions regarding improvement of or uh, improvement or increase in output right here you can see technical progress functions economic measure that seeks to identify attributable influence of technological progress on total output that what is the influence of technology on output basically they use regression model regression basically they use statistical model so regression is a statistical tool which is uh, which is used to find out the impact of one factor on another factor right right so we do not need to go into the details of regression right uh, only knowing that it is a statistical tool is enough for now um, so yes the influence of particular factors like technology on output right it can be an <coughs> important factor in country's economic growth because helps a country to produce more by the use of better technology on the input side of production equation so this is the reason why many countries they try to import technology they try to import uh, advanced machinery so that they can improve their production capacity right guys if you remember when we, in the session where we talked about japan's loss taken we talked about how japan carried out its economic miracle being a resource deficient country it was trying to imitate the western model or it was trying to make the best use of capitalize the technology which had already been found by which had already been discovered by the western nation by maintaining good relations with them and importing their technology right so basically Uh, you can see the influence of technology on the development of a country be it south korea also you can see the uh, the, the development miracle of south korea right so rather than looking at economic production growth purely in terms of input allocation efficiency technical progress provides a way of measuring technological progress as a contributor to final final production overall right so see basically this embodied technical progress and disembodied technical technical progress if we this if we read these two terms separately or if we study about these two terms separately that is going to give you an idea that what is the contribution of technology to the particular to a particular sector there can be an industry where technology does not contribute much it, it it depends upon labor more or it depends upon capital more right so capital and technology they are interrelated because anyhow spending capital leads to better technology right moving ahead to the next question okay here is your third question for today which is akash wants to invest in a bond fund which will lead to creation of a bond ladder and provide guarantee regarding the maturity of bond securities which type of bond do you think he should invest in right a simple question talks about you have to identify that out of these options which is going to be the suitable fit for akash moving ahead to the solution and the correct option is option c option c means target maturity bond etf so the, this is one etf type which was recently mentioned into mint into one of the mint article right okay now talking about what are these target maturity bond etf before that i would like to talk about the difference between investing into individual bonds and investing into a bond fund or you can say a pool of money which invests into different bonds 
आई होप यू अंडरस्टैंड द मीनिंग ऑफ बॉन्ड फंड इट इज सिंपली अ कलेक्शन और अ पूल of money which puts money into different types of bonds that is why it is called a bond fund right so when you invest into an individual fund the major benefit that the investor gets is that he knows that when the bond is going to be redeemed basically there is a certain guarantee that when you when the investor is going to get their money back that is not certain in the case of equity so basically they have a fixed maturity or fixed mid redemption period right that provides certainty or stability to the investor whereas if we talk about bond fund the the main advantage here is diversification right because money is being invested into a number of bonds not one particular bond right so the main benefit is of diversification obviously but the problem here is the stability is less because uh in a fund you don't know when which bond is going to mature right so might be possible one bond is getting mature after 5 years one is getting matured after 10 years so there is a uh, lesser stability as compared to individual bond where the terms and conditions are known beforehand right so these so uh, basically now we talk about something called target maturity bond etf which tries to combine the benefits of both these options so it is called target maturity bond etf now what is it let's try to understand about this okay so these funds target maturity bond etf i hope guys you are familiar with the term etf if not you can watch our session on etf in which we have detail in which we have discussed the meaning of etf in detail you can ask for its link in the comments right so uh, simply saying etf is just like mutual fund it's it's a collection of money wi- uh, which puts money into different type of investment not one investment but but it is slightly different from mutual fund is due to some operational differences right so these funds they are just like e regular etfs but the point is the the all the bonds in which this particular target maturity bond etf is going to invest they mature in the same year so do you see that it is obviously investing into a number of bonds which provides the benefit of diversification but these bonds they are going to be invested Uh, they are going to be they are going to be redeemed in a particular year so that here the investor gets the benefit of stability as well right or the investor is certain that if i am investing into this edf all the bonds under this scheme they are going to be mature within 5 years or within 10 years so it tries to combine the benefit of both type of bonds right so this is target maturity bond fund as you can see as each bond matures fund moves into moves the proceeds into cash or cash equivalents right so by, uh, when the maturity of bond is approaching the uh, the fund tries to collect money or convert them into cash because they have to redeem the investors or return the money of investors to them so uh, so rather than reinvesting them they are converted into cash or cash equivalents right so investors can also create a ladder or a series of bonds guys we discussed about the strategy of laddering in one of the previous session so i hope you remember it so these type of bonds they help uh, they 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 help in creation of a bond ladder which is which is a strategy for uh, for combining for combining stability and risk right so bond funds they provide diversification in a single investment but they don't have a maturity date so this tells you about the problems with bond fund that they do not have a maturity date that leaves the investor into uncertainty right okay so investors have no guarantee that all of their principal will be there at a specific point in future as the case with individual bonds right so as you can see at the funds maturity dates they cease operations their value is returned to shareholders so this is being ta- talked about target maturity bond etf 
that when their maturity approaches they are converted into liquid assets so that they can, the money can be returned to the investor right they have a known date at which principal will be returned so i so the simple part is basically combining the benefits of both investing into individual bond and investing into a bond fund right so that is target maturity bond etf moving ahead to the next question this question says under rbi norms a single entity can only buy less than this percent in any private bank without its approval without rbi's prior approval right so this is in relation to a recent case that we have discussed in detail moving ahead to the solution and the correct option is option e that means 5% so rbi's norms they say that one entity which is investing into a bank if it has not taken rbi's approval to buy the stake into a private bank they cannot buy they have to buy less than 5% percent right so basically one uh, one investor cannot have a significant investment into a private bank without the approval of rbi and if they do not wish to take the approval they have to invest less than 5% so 5% is the maximum limit right now why are we talking about this because recently rbi has started a probe rbi and sebi both they are investigating getting a case of the infamous lakshmi vilas bank which has recently faced and it is being merged into development bank of singapore as a rescue measure right so now it is being cited or it has come to the notice of regulators like rbi and sebi that there are many investors who have bought more than a share of 5% into lakshmi vilas bank without telling or without getting this approved from the regulators right so they are investigating whether actually these investors they have violated the norms or not as you can see here investigating whether some large shareholders of the troubled lender bought the stake through proxy entities beyond the regulatory cap which is which is 5% in the middle of its search for buyer see lakshmi vilas bank was desperate for a buyer because it needed financial help and uh, since it needed a buyer it might have allowed many uh, entities to buy a stake which is more than 5% without the approval of rbi because see uh, taking approval from rbi means uh, getting into formalities and it takes a lot of time it is not a very speedy process right so it might be possible that they uh, they are trying to use the loopholes to invest or to invest a larger stake or to buy a larger stake without letting rbi know probe aims to determine whether these shareholders were trying to exert influence over the board through these proxies now these investors who hold a significant stake they obviously exert some influence over the board they have voting power and they have some say in the decision making progress here you can see some data at the time uh, lakshmi vilas bank's share capital was wiped out i hope you remember that they they decided the uh, regulator said that they would have to wipe off uh, its additional tier 2 bonds tier 2 bonds as a part of rescue measure which uh, which reduces the burden of paying of the creditors of lvb so promoter entities held 6.8% in lvbs while rest 93.2 was owned by public shareholders right both small and large swift action by central bank and the government ensured rbi's depositors retained their serving obviously that was a loss for additional tier 2 bond holders of lakshmi vilas bank but at least people who have put their hard hardened money into the banks they have more chances of getting their money back so for from the point of view of regulator from the point of view of rbi it is better to save depositors money as compared to investors who have already invested into risky capital like tier 1 or tier 2 bonds right i hope you remember the case of yes yes bank where tier 1 bonds were wiped off okay moving ahead to the last question for today which says a dash is a consumer's credit score which is based on past credit behavior a very simple question a very known term correct option for this question is option c option c means sibil score c i b i l sibil score 
so civil score is simply just like marks given to a student just as uh, marks are given to a student after evaluating his or her performance in the class on different different parameters civil score civil score are also like marks or evaluation which are given to a particular borrower looking at their credit worthiness or looking at their credit history right so the better the borrower the the speedier the repayments or uh, the the uh, the better the credit culture followed by the borrower the better is the civil score now why do, why do borrowers need civil score because if they need to borrow in future they have a proof just as students need students when they pass out school they need to get into colleges they can show their good marks that see okay i am a 90% holder that means i am a good student and i should get admission into this college uh, because of my good performance in school similarly the banks the borrowers who want to borrow from financial institutions or banks if they have a proof of their credit worthiness if they have a proof of their performance that i have never defaulted on any of my emi i have been a good borrower that is why i deserve to take a loan or i deserve to uh, to be to be defined as a credit worthy borrower right so someone with high civil score has more chances of getting a loan as compared to someone who has uh, who has lower civil score it is basically a three digit numeric summary of a consumer's credit history so it is three digit and summarizes the credit history you can just uh, have an idea about anyone's credit history by looking at their civil score reflections of person's credit profile based on see it is definitely based on past credit behavior but it impacts the future borrowing capacity of the borrower so it is also forward look it is uh, backward looking at the same time it is forward looking such right by banks and lenders with civil on a regular basis the details of which are featured in consumers civil report right so it's like a report card that is provided to a student in schools ranges between 300 to 900 closer to 900 means that the borrower is credit worthy and there are higher chances of getting the loan application approved right past behavior is taken as an indicator for future actions as i just told you forward look uh, backward looking and forward looking in line with that civil score showcases a consumer's credit worthiness see guys in the coming time data is going to be one of the most important thing probably more important than some natural resources data is uh, i think it, it has become very important for today's time as you can see many companies uh, having cases on them or getting sued for misusing customers or their clients data so data is very important so civil score is one thing that is going to be uh, very important for anyone who wants to take a loan right so it is it is important to inculcate a good credit culture or to maintain a good civil score if you want your future repaying future borrowing potential to stay up tight, to stay uh, or or to stay uh, liberated or to stay open right so this is civil score so guys these were the five questions for today i hope you learned something new from this video and if you did then do not forget to hit the like button because i'll be back in next session with some new information till then you keep watching take care of yourselves and thank you for being here